Welcome to the Prolific Creations Podcast. Today, I am joined by Geneva Escovedo, an art, art, excuse me, author based here in Tucson, Arizona. So welcome, Geneva. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, so uh, I know you have two books that are out as of right now. Uh, can you kind of walk us through what inspired you, first of all, to write your, your first book? Okay, that was a that was a ten year project in the making, uh, and it all started um, with uh, conversations with my father and mother around the kitchen table having cafecito, and uh, in conversation, my father would always come up with a dicho that was passed on by his mother, my grandma Maria, to him, and. Um, after several of those visits, I thought, you know, these are really important to write down, to to keep because they they're teachable moments. Because we talked about them, he translated them. We talked about what it meant. Um, at that time, I was just collecting the dichos. I was doing a lot of journal writing. This was when I was uh, working on my undergraduate degree at Arizona State University. Um, and then I decided I thought it was important to uh, document the the story of the the immigration story of my great grandparents and grandparents. Uh, I I did it. I wanted to do it. That was sort of the focus, their story and the history of my family, so that it could be documented for future generations of Escoleros. And as I got into writing each, uh, select, I selected 20 dichos that I thought were the most significant in my life that were lessons. Uh, and my mother helped me a lot with the stories because I wanted to make sure that they were accurate. I wasn't exaggerating and that it, they really did relay the family values that, that dichos are about. So it took me um, it took me several years to just write it down and kind of shape shape it as a manuscript. During that time, I was uh, very involved in a women's writing group. It was called Sowing the Seeds. It it no longer is, exists, but some of the women that I um, had the pleasure of working with, um, uh, they are. Um, I am part of another women's writing group so that I can continue my writing. But this particular um, writing group helped me shape the stories and think about how I would shape the book. Yeah. Uh, I got some really good ideas from them. I got some feedback on some of the stories that I wrote about it. And um, actually, the my first book... Um, uh, wasn't the first time I was published. Um, prior to that, um, a group, there were about 30 of us women that would meet monthly and we'd share each other's work. And we decided to put together a women's anthology. And mm -hmm. it turned out really, really well. I have uh, 11 pieces in that anthology. And it was... Um, uh, published by a local publishing company here, Wheatmark. It's called Our Spirit, Our Reality, Celebrating Our Stories. So there were poems and stories. And um, we were able to, to uh, present at libraries and present uh, our work um, as a group of women. And also we were able to present at the Festival of Books just before it was printed. Mm. So... That was my first um, um, experience in being part of a group to put together a book. So that that experience really did help me think about when I wanted to do my own book. Mm -hmm. So I was um, I was really fortunate to get a lot of feedback from um, colleagues. I was working at Pima Community College at that time. Uh, there, there were a couple of women who had degrees in Spanish, and I wanted to make sure that the Spanish, the dicho in Spanish, was correct. So right. I got a lot of feedback on that, 
And then um, after pulling that first manuscript together, uh, I contacted my uh, a former colleague of mine at, uh, who I worked with her at Arizona State University, Dr. Uh, Chris Marine. Uh, she was she was a librarian and a professor of history. Uh, she's an, a remarkable uh, woman, and I really look up to her. And I had retired, and I had this manuscript, and I said, "I'm, I'm got to do this. I've been working on this for a long time. I want to do this." So I called her, let her know I just retired, and I said, "By the way, I just finished a manuscript called Dichos de Mi Padre, Sayings mm -hmm. of My Father." Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas on a publisher? And she says, I just so happen to know someone. It worked out so perfect. It was perfect timing. Right. She was editing a book uh, uh, by a um, uh, an, another Arizona author who was having it published uh, by the Hispanic Institute of Social Issues. They have a publishing arm to that organization. So she gave me the contact, um, and I contacted her, and I told her I had spoken to to Dr. Marine and that I had a manuscript, and would it be okay to send it to her? She goes, yeah. "Sure, I'd be in, I'd be interested in looking at it." Well, that was another several month journey from that point on. So I right. sent the manuscript, and I was fortunate in that. It didn't need a lot of editing because I had a lot of people already look at it. But what she did do is, and I hadn't really thought of it until, you know, she, she's looking at from the from the lens of a publisher and yeah. what the reader's going to be yeah. attracted to. And she says, I think you should reverse your book and start with the dichos and end with the family stories. Mm. And I said, because you title it Dichos de Mi Padre. And I said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, so we reconfigured uh, the manuscript and she designed the book. She did a beautiful job designing the book. I was just so pleased uh, uh, to work with her. She was very easy to work with. And she does work with a lot of uh, men and women Latino authors. Mm -hmm. uh, she, there are other people that she publishes, but um, they uh, they really were making a name for themselves as a, as a publishing organization. So I was very, very fortunate to get connected to her. Um, this book has... Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to share it with different um, uh, different classes to this day. I, I um, had it published in 2018, and then in 2019, um, I submitted it for an award at the International Latino Book Awards Program. I knew nothing about this organization out of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, I have a really good friend who's an author, um, uh, El Kiwis, who's an author in Phoenix, and he encouraged me. He, we encourage each other's work, and he's done some wonderful book, oh, some great books, children's books and yeah. other books. And he says, Geneva, you should submit it. What the hey? I said, oh, okay. Why not? I've got nothing to lose, so I'll right. submit it. Right. <laughs> um, and that was a whole other experience. Um, so it uh, every year... Around September, they they have um, they have a call for authors, playwrights, poets um, to submit their work, and there are many many categories of awards programs. So uh, I submitted it in two categories, and um, uh, the one uh, I was selected for one of them. It was best first book. Mm -hmm. uh, nonfiction and uh, it was it was it was really an honor when I got the email message that you have been nominated and uh, accepted and the, and uh, they invited me to the awards show it was held at um, 
in Los Angeles. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. The, yeah. And they do this every year. Um, so uh, I was thrilled. Um, we didn't know who was going to win when mm -hmm. we got there because they made those announcements at that time. Um, and they go by each category. Uh, I did get, um, I didn't get first place, but to be among four winners, um, right. was, uh, honorable mention to me, that was, that was quite an achievement. Right. So what started out as a book to, um, relay to my family about our history and the importance of vichos and what they mean in our culture mm -hmm. uh, and what they mean in our family because they, the vichos are really about family values, right. um, I think has, uh, has really made an impact. Um, uh, I have presented to, to college students, uh, to high school students. Um, uh, I, when I, the book was just released, um, I was able to be one of the authors in the author's pavilion at um, the Tucson Festival of Books. Mm -hmm. So that was the second time I was involved with the Festival of Books. So, right. um, yeah. So um, to me, being a writer um, at this age, you know, I started to really seriously pursue being an author um, just after I retired because I could devote the time to it. Um, I could explore, um, what other kinds of things I wanted to write about. Yeah. And for me, it's been important to continue with, a with the women's writing group so that I can keep, um, keep writing and getting those, getting those thoughts out. Right. Yeah. For sure. And so uh, there's a word that you, you keep saying, and I, I kind of want you to elaborate a little bit more on, on what that is and just the importance of um, the word bichos, right? Yes. Um, just kind of how that relates to, first of all, you know, you as an, as an author and how that's kind of been implemented, obviously, throughout your first book and just that importance and the feelings that it brings and, and how it influences your creativity. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, vichos, um, as I mentioned, is such a strong part of the Latino culture. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's just so many of them, and they're made up by family members and right. uh, just in conversation. And some of them are universal. Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you yeah. spend your time with and I'll tell you who you are. Right. Uh, and it, it is important who we surround ourselves with uh, in our life. And I try to surround myself with uh, positive, uh, positive people. But vichos kind of are at the core of, of our family and how we relate to each other. Um, Sadly, we're starting to lose that that the Spanish um, in the newer generation. So I think right. with this, it's important to relay that what that dicho is and to have a conversation about it, right. because in in those conversations, sometimes you will get somebody who said, "Oh, my grandma used to say this dicho." and they would relay it, and I go, "Oh, I love it. I haven't heard that one before." Right. And, and so um, it's what's passed on from generation to generation. And right. I think it's an important thing to continue in, in our family dynamics, in our family conversations, and in our schools. Right. Um, I was, um, when my book first came out, um, I was asked to um, participate in one of the library programs they were having a literary festival mm -hmm. and uh and so i said oh yes i would love to be there um so i i was there um the the mayor uh regina romero was very involved in that project and uh, there were several authors that were there and it was just great to interact with the community and see older people and younger people interested 
in in the Dichos book. And the fact that I have my father's um, photo when he was in the military, mm-hmm. that attracted a certain number of people that wanted to know more about the book. Right. Uh, one of the individuals that got excited about my book was a master teacher in TUSD. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have, they are using my book in their culturally responsive pedagogy and instruction program uh, because it is it uh, when you have authors talk about the culture uh, that can and the, and that students Latino students can relate to that. Mm-hmm. I think it makes for positive learning. Yeah, and uh, it influences. Um, thinking yeah Yeah. so i hope i answered your question oh yeah yeah yeah, for sure um (laughs) and so then in a time where it's easy for you know especially with my generation and and generations after me um where we're not just focusing now on on the sayings that our parents or our grandparents you know our great grandparents would even tell us right and uh how then do you think we can ensure that, you know, the sayings that are passed down, right, continue to stay either within the family or, uh, you know, I don't want to say as relevant, but just important, right, or um, evident in a person's life and like, hey, you know, uh, I remember when, you know, so-and-so said this. I remember when, you know, my grandparents said this, my mom or my dad said this, or, you know, my cousin, whatever. And, mm-hmm. and really just making sure and ensuring that it's still impactful in, again, in today's generation. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think, um, like, when I speak to student groups, and I talk about that, uh, um, I ask them, do you remember anything like an aunt, a grandma or a grandpa mm-hmm. that shared um words of wisdom. It doesn't have to be in Spanish, but something that they tried to teach you, some words of wisdom that struck you. Um, And oftentimes I'll get them to write about it, to write Mm -hmm. about the advice that you were given by your nana or your tío or your tía. Um, And it doesn't necessarily have to be a dicho um, because dichos are, they're creative in their own right. Some are yeah. poetic, some are yeah. sad, some are funny. <laughs> right. So and, it's it's important to have those uh, conversations where they can share their family stories. Right. Right. That's where it kind of comes yeah. out. Yeah, and I think um, I think as as um, you know as time continues, it's it's interesting to I don't know if you ever heard of the the game telephone. Um, right where you have just you're kind of sitting in a circle with friends or people and one person whispers something into the person next to them and you know that whisper goes all the way around until it comes back and then you know usually <laughs> the original saying is not what was originally said it's something you know depending it, on yes, obviously the people yes. in the circle and it's either something completely just wacky right and just like that's not even remotely close to what I was saying or you know it mm-hmm. was something similar right maybe summarized or maybe a different word was used for something else and and so mm-hmm. it's interesting to see reading literature now and uh, the way that um, dichos, right, sayings, uh, uh, just uh, things that are important for us to keep in mind and how it's really evolved and maybe even, you know, adapted into today's times and how uh, it still okay. can be relevant and, and, you know, again, just in and how it's adapted to today's times, right? Because um, mm-hmm. obviously you know, how some things were, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, right, mm-hmm. are not necessarily the same today, but in most cases, the the, the seed right. of that beach or of that saying or of that um, a moral, whatever you want to call it, it can still be relevant okay. in, to today's times. And um, I, don't, uh, I don't know how much on, you know, social media you're on, but like on looking at Facebook, TikTok, um, uh, YouTube, mm-hmm. and just the things that's out there, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, content that's being put out by people um you some things are just people get so famous over and it's like well 
you know, that's just like a different way of saying, you know, this or a different way of saying mm -hmm. that it went around for forever, you know, and it's reading through the comments. These people are like, wow, that was so great. Wow. That was so amazing. And, and it baffles me, um, even t when teaching a class that, you know, even the most simplest things are the things that you may have heard, you know, growing up as a child, right. This mm -hmm. new generation of, of, of people are just like, what is that? Like, I never even heard of that. Like, what does that even mean? Like, how can, you know, okay, what's the point? How do I, you know, why did, why is it important to me? And so, uh, again, it just baffles me on just how so many people are just so uh, mesmerized by something that seems new, but has been around for, for so long. Yeah. Right? Well, I think that we can um, um, introduce Dicho's um uh, at every generation of classroom and try to um, apply it to where they are today. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, when I was uh, in, in an English class and I shared a dicho about, um, um, uh, ab about meeting your goals, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you have to take a step at a time to meet your goals. And the dicho right. was about that. Right. Um, and um, at first, it's kind of puzzling when you share the dicho and they go, yeah, what does that mean? So you kind right. of like break it down. I try to break it down and try to yeah. relay it to to their everyday life. And they go, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get right. it, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. And so um, as we continue to talk about your creativity, can you kind of, kind of lead us into um, into your second book, right? What kind of inspired you to... Um, obviously after publishing your first, go on to say, hey, you know what, I think I'm ready to, you know, start creating or start even putting together a second book. Yeah, that was, uh, that this, the second book didn't take as long to get to the publishing part of it. Um, I had over the years, um, collected, um, stories and poems mm -hmm. that I knew I wanted to do something with. They didn't quite fit my Beatles book. There was, it was just something different. Right. And I just kept writing them. Um, and as I uh, we continued with our women's writing group, uh, especially during COVID, during yeah. that time, we actually met more on Zoom than we did, than we do now. We meet monthly in person and we we kind of inspire each other's work. And so we um, created a lot of different prompts as to what was going on around us. So we used that opportunity to create new work. And um, a lot of the pieces in my new book um, are, are part of that. And, I'll, um, uh, and it took it took a, a lot of feedback from my fellow writers as I was thinking about how I wanted to shape the second book. I wanted it to be a collection of poems and stories. Um, I have not yet gotten into a novel at this point. <laughs> uh, right now I'm into stories and poems. Poems um, come to be a little easier a little uh, when I think about it. Um, if it's an occurrence and I just want to write about that feeling right. or that, uh, the essence. So, right. um, by the time I, I looked at putting the manuscript together, I said, Oh my gosh, I have 60 pieces I've written over the past, um, five years or so. Right. And so I just started, um, I started looking at other authors and how they put their work together. Mm -hmm. Like Sandra C. Snettles has beautiful collections of poems and how she created the chapters and how she put those together. Um, so I I looked at a lot of those authors in in putting mine together. And um, then I had a conversation with one of my fellow writers about what to call it. Mm. And um, the, the word reflections came to mind it kind of like a prominent word because mm -hmm. I was reflecting on lots of different things as I was putting together these pieces. Mm -hmm. So the book is called Reflections of the Heart, Stories and Poems from Life. 
And I got the second part of the title from a workshop um, and a book that um, one of the English faculty, she's marvelous, uh, Meg Files, she had put together uh, at Pima Community College, uh, Pima Writers Workshops, and I would go to a lot of those. And and I wrote some, some of the pieces I wrote were from those workshops. And she had a book that says, write from life. And I said, that makes sense. You know, write what you know. And so that's why um, I titled the book uh, that I did. And I also wanted to um, uh, not only reflect on my life um, at different parts of my life, but also to reflect on other people who have made a difference in my life. Of course, yeah. my mother. I dedicated the book to my mother and my three stepdaughters. Um, um, they helped me to know, to learn what it is to be a mom. Yeah. Um, so that that process was like a labor of love because I wanted to write about the people that I care about, the people that I lost that are still uh, very much a part of who I am. Yeah. And just. Um, Putting it together, and I had a lot of fun titling the chapters. Uh, uh, there's uh, right. uh, eight chapters in the book. And mm -hmm. it's not a very large book, but it, to me, I think it's profound. I think people can relate to my stories and and perhaps have similar stories or a, a person that reminded them that, you know, they would want to acknowledge or write about. Yeah, for sure. So then I know you mentioned earlier that uh, for both books, it took uh, uh, quite a bit of time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't something obviously that came overnight or anything, but even then, how did you make sure that your creativity was consistent, right? Especially in for your first book where it did take, you know, a series of, of years. And so how did mm -hmm. you ensure that consistency throughout? Um, I think first and foremost was the desire to get to actually create the book. Um, it was, um, I just felt um, a need to um, uh, relay my stories. And I still feel that way. I still have a lot more to write about and a lot more to say. Um, but I think... Um, as I've gotten older, that there are things that I could share that may um, awaken others in wanting to do the same, right. or at least talking about a family member, like talking about their nana and the memories that their nana has, uh, that they recall and that are important. Yeah. Um, I don't really get tired of writing. Um, I've got tons of journals. I've got a journal for good thoughts at night, a journal that um, when I'm feeling angst, I just, um, I need to get it out. So part of my, um, of uh, dealing with emotions is, mm -hmm. is through writing. Now, I don't publish everything. I wouldn't want to <laughs> um, at, when I put these uh, thoughts out on paper. But yeah. every once in a while, something resonates, and I go, "Oh, that would make a good story," or I think I need to work on that poem a little bit, a little bit more. Right. But it's it's like um, it's like who I am now. Uh, it's it's now part of my identity, and uh, I just want to keep writing and definitely keep reading. I yeah, I'm an avid reader, and I like to read. Um, uh, an array of authors, men and women, that are very inspiring, and I like the way they share their stories and the yeah. words that they use and how they describe people and places. Right, right. And so what advice would you give then to someone that's uh, beginning to, you know, uh, write? And, and maybe not the end goal of publishing, right, but maybe just mm -hmm. for fun, as you mentioned, and, you know, especially in a time where... You know, there's a lot of books out there, right? There's a lot of content. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things that um, can obviously inspire creativity and 
and uh, just draw inspiration from. But what advice would you give to those those begin, beginning writers of being able mm-hmm. to make sure that their persona, their personality, what they're wanting uh, just mm-hmm. really shines through as they're writing? Yeah. Well, I think um, for me, it was journaling. And I would recommend that to uh, anyone who um, has an interest in writing, that that's, that's where it starts. I like the act of writing. And then once I have something in a journal, then I can take that piece, uh, type it in the computer, take a look at it, you know, go through several editing. So I would say that one, that journaling, that act of writing is... Uh, uh, can it can be thought provoking? It can um, awaken um, awaken your senses, like uh, describing uh, where you were, what the day was like, what the smells were around. You know how you describe those instances. And then I think, uh, at least for me, it worked is to continue to learn about writing. I t- yeah. I've taken poetry classes. I would take another writing class. I still have um, a, a goal for 2024 is um, is to take a class at the, uh, at the university's um, poetry center. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got to readings of poets there, and um, and then attend uh, book events. Um, right. And if you find uh, maybe you want to form your own little writing group, um, uh, which is what what uh, our group of women are now, and we we really do nurture each other. So, so I would say the journaling, um, reading about people that you like to hear their story, you, you like to understand their stories, or that you admire no. them, yeah. or go to events where you hear poets and writers because they do inspire you. I mean, I love to go to, to poetry readings and, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm a student at heart. I always have been, you know, learning is a lifetime experience for me and Mm -hmm. uh, I'm never done learning. So I still think I have a lot to learn about being an excellent writer. I just, you know, want to get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. So then I know you mentioned collaboration and working with um, uh, other people and just talking to other people. How important is it then to uh, being creative? Um, just collaborating with others, uh, you know, having that one person that, you know, that you can call at any point and just being like, hey, you know, can you give me some advice on this, some tips on this? Or, you know, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on this? And so uh, can you kind of go into yeah. detail of just like how vital you know, that collaboration is when someone is being creative. Yes. Well, um, I, um, will have one-on-one dialogue with, um, the, the women in my group and also, um, the, the friend that I mentioned, El Kiwis, who is an author in, uh, in the Phoenix area. And he gives me some good feedback and I say, Hey, I'm thinking about this or, um, I'm almost done with my manuscript. Would you take a look at it? And I always get wonderful feedback from yeah. him. Um, but when I do one-on-one, um, the feedback that I get from another writer is uh, I get like a nuance, uh, something I hadn't thought about, mm-hmm. or maybe I didn't. I didn't explain enough. I need to write a little bit more about what I, what I originally shared with them. It's right. not quite there. Uh, and then I get some really excellent feedback. Um, and I'll give you a funny story that occurred um, where uh, my friend and I decided to write on the same topic. Mm-hmm. And it turned out to be hilarious. Uh she got this little um, marketing like label. It was a coffee cup, and it said "cafecito con chisme," mm. a little bit of coffee with gossip. Yeah, and and on the bottom of it says "no me digas," don't tell me. 
And so we just started talking about it. And uh, I said, hey, let's write a poem about that. Wouldn't that be fun? Well, she beat me to the punch. She wrote the poem before I wrote mine, and mm -hmm. she shared it with me. It was hilarious. So it took me a while. Uh, I finally got mine written, I, and it, it came in Spanish. Sometimes that's how a poem will come to me. So it came mm -hmm. in Spanish. I wanted to make sure the Spanish was correct, and then I translated it, and then I shared it with, with her, and she started yeah. laughing. So that's a poem that we'll probably share uh, at some point, the two of us. It isn't published yet, but it's like one of the newest pieces of creativity. And yeah. you never know what's going to kick it off. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So can you kind of talk about the little bit more of um, another time of when something has kind of just inspired me, like, hey, you know what? Just hold on. Let me take a pause at what I'm doing. And like, I just really need to write something down about this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I um, I went to a a workshop. It was an interesting workshop in in New Mexico. Uh, a friend and a friend of I um, a friend and I went, and uh, the workshop was called "The Spirituality of Brokenness," which is a really intriguing title. Mm -hmm. And we got a book about it, and. Um, it was a workshop about spirituality, and we and there were people from different religious denominations: Jewish, Methodist. There were priests, there were women pastors. There it was a, just a real a mix of people, and um, we read the book. We um, just talked about different experiences and uh, our experiences in in um, in our spirituality. And then we took uh, a little visit um, uh, near, uh, it was a labyrinth. Mm. And uh, we, we each were told to begin the labyrinth with an intention, just to have that experience. So we did that and we walked around because there's a certain way that you go around the labyrinth mm -hmm. and it, it cuts and then you go to the center and then you got to come back out. And during the time, the journey of you are going through the labyrinth and labyrinth and coming back out, um, you, you reflect on, on something important to you. You contemplate it, yeah. it's it's kind of the, the the purpose of it um and so i was really taken aback by that experience and uh when i went to sedona a few years um later i found a labyrinth um behind this resort uh it was like a rustic resort um near where we where my friends and i were staying and i go oh wow a labyrinth so I did the same thing, I did the contemplate, and I had to write about it. I yeah. had to put into words. And that particular poem uh, is in my new book, in um, yeah. Reflections of the Heart. So it's some instances like that that spur something that you need to write about it, just to get it, to get it out of your head. Right. And to take a look at it and what impact it had on you. And it might have an impact on somebody else who reads it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you mentioned um, and how, you know, just that spur of the moment inspiration comes. Is there ever a time where um, you were wanting to write something, but you didn't know how to approach it? And so, um, you know, for most people, most of the time, most of the time it's athletes. They'll have kind of like a ritual, right? But right before a game, they'll, I don't know, drink a bottle of water. They'll, um, you uh -huh. know, and stretch in a certain order or, you know, um, even mm -hmm. as a, uh, people that write, well, I don't know, uh, read a certain quote and be like, yeah, okay, I can work from this. Or, you know, myself as a, as a pianist, I'll listen to certain music that will, you know, evoke creativity. So is there any ritual that you follow as a writer to really inspire that creativity in a time where you're not, you know, really feeling as inspired as you would normally be? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, um, 
For me, it's important to have that quiet time before I go to bed. Mm. Either I read something inspirational or I reflect on something that occurred in my journal. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to give yourself that that quiet time because you don't know what's going to emerge. Um, yeah. Sometimes I'll just... Um, open up my journal and, and uh, write about what happened that day or if there was some significant um, dialogue I had with somebody and it spurs something else. Right. Um, but then also uh, taking that time um, to read someone else's inspiring story. Yeah. Uh, someone else that that published or um, uh, a new author. I've, um, uh, I um, and then and then there are times when you you listen to a program, and somebody introduces this new author and a young author, or someone that writes very different from you and very mm -hmm. in a very different topic, and mm -hmm. I go, wow, I really want to read that person's work. Yeah. And uh, I find that inspiring um, yeah. in in thinking about what else I would like to write about. Right, right. Awesome, yeah. Um, is there ever a time where, or can you tell us about a time where, um, I don't know, maybe something in nature has ever inspired you? I know you mentioned a, a, a kind of a, like a labyrinth before, but I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. ever, another time ever being out in nature, whether that be in the mountains or... Um, you know, walking through a forest or something where you're like, hey, like this is, you know, I can make something out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have um, um, a really nice uh, backyard. Um, uh, my mother loves to plant flowers and we have trumpet vines and we have in the spring, it's wonderful. And the hummingbirds come and the little finches come. And um, when it's spring or fall, when you can sit out there for a long time, I think it's those moments um, being in the present yeah. where you listen to the birds or you listen to the 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 leaves make noises um, off the tree. Just those little uh, little parts of nature. Or when I've gone on a hike and I just sit there and I look at the panoramic views and that that can inspire a piece, just the beauty yeah. of it all, a sunset yeah. or a sunrise. Or I think it's important to, to, to give yourself that time to, to be in nature and to appreciate where we are. Uh, in our lives and to appreciate our surroundings and and just the the beauty of the place right yeah hmm. yeah and so as you pour out your passion into your writing uh can you kind of tell us a little bit about a time when you were writing and uh just the feelings that you were having as you were writing um well i've um i've had a lot of loss of family in my life um mm -hmm. um that of course is painful like it is for many people and um, um when my when my brother died after we were in a very serious accident i had a lot of trouble grieving um uh, part of it was because i'm the oldest in the family and i had to arrange for everything and take care of the other family members um and i I didn't have the time to grieve because I was so immersed in all of the doing. Right. Well, one night I couldn't sleep and I was reflecting on the accident. And that's when the grief came out. I started to write about it. Um, and it's in my new book. Um, it's called The Crash. Uh and that is the that's probably the long the longest piece that I've written where I was sobbing through the whole time. It was such a release of that grief and that sadness. 
And when I went back and looked at it again and then went through the editing, I realized that for me it was a healing process. Yeah. And some of my writing is about healing around the people that we really love and we've lost and unexpectedly lose. And right. to me, that's one way of um, of coping, but it, in another way, it's it's to honor them for who they were and what yeah. they meant. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a tough one. That was right. probably one of the toughest ones that I've written, but it, to me, it was an important thing to write. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell us about a, uh, a, a happy moment that you ended up writing about? Oh, let's see. Lots of happy moments with children. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So we got so many beautiful babies in our family. And just um, writing about their new this new person that came into the world with this this little character, this yeah. this beautiful little thing. And to me, that's the most delightful thing to write. Um, I have a, a little cousin. His name is Avery, hmm. and I wrote a poem called um, "Avery's Eyes." He has these amazing big brown almond eyes with luscious, luscious, dark lashes. <laughs> Just this beautiful child. So I kind of wrote about um, about his his little personality and his um, the beautiful child that he is and the handsome man that he's going to be. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of a fun one. I love to write about children and they make my heart happy and and it's just it's it's just touching to capture that moment in their little lives or their little young lives right it's right yeah for sure awesome mm -hmm. awesome well uh thank you for sharing that geneva um can you kind of tell uh, our listeners of kind of where they can find your books and uh where they can be looking out for uh your newest book Oh, okay. Well, um, uh, my website is GenevaCreativeWriting.com, and you can order my books uh, off the website. Um, they're on Amazon. Um, my newest book, uh, Reflections of the Heart, Stories and Poems from Life, is on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, and it's also an ebook. And I will be at the Tucson Festival of Books, um, uh, my publisher um, has a table there, Wheat Mart Publishers, and on Sunday, March the 10th, from 9.15 to 10.45, I will be there selling both books uh, and engaging with, um, with readers of all, of all sorts. Now, as for my new book, um, I've been kind of stabbing at this a little bit at a time. I think... Um, my, the brother that I mentioned that passed away after we were in an accident, he was an amazing artist. He was a silversmith and a goldsmith. He made beautiful pieces of jewelry. And I have lots of photos of those. So I've been working on, on his story as an emerging artist uh, and jeweler and um, silversmith. Mm -hmm. And uh, that he has so many categories of jewelry that he made that um, it's going to take me a little while to pull it together. It'll be sort of like a picture book uh, to honor his beautiful work. He has sold many pieces to friends and family, and um, I've been able to collect pictures of, of what they made them because I wasn't able to see everything he's made, but. Right. Uh, I'm very blessed to have some beautiful pieces that he made for me, but it's a way to honor him as an artist and uh, to share his story. 